Stanford professor Dr. Gary Nolan has just presented test results from UFO materials from two different UFO crash sites. Let's dive in and take a closer look. If you're new to the channel, y'all, and you like content like this, please hit that subscribe button. We put out a new video every day, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. I do not miss a day, y'all. And of course, hit that like button, y'all. That really helps out the video. So thank y'all vetters so much for the support there. And of course, comment down below of what do you think of these, uh, in particular, these new soul videos, um, but particularly Dr. Gary Nolan's uh, the results, right? That's, this is what we always want. UFO materials being tested and the results being out there. So I'm curious what y'all think of these findings. Um, and do you agree with some of his, I would call them assumptions of, of the findings, to be honest with you, because it's still kind of inconclusive. As we go through the two different clips here, you'll understand what I'm talking about. All right, let's dive in. So real quickly, just to set this up, the first one is going to be Uba Tuba. Okay, this took place in Brazil, 1957, supposedly. Um, and then the other one is going to be Socorro, New Mexico, right? And again, he has UFO materials from them, supposedly meta materials that he has tested, right? He's going to talk about the results here. And um, I, I find it fascinating because, again, this is what we're always talking about. And to be honest with you, it's kind of it's a little boring in the sense of like it's kind of like college classroom stuff. But it's like I know we get enticed by the stories and, you know, music and lighting and, and you know, reenactments. And that's kind of all the exciting stuff. But at the end of the day, this is kind of what disclosure will look like just test results of different materials and stuff and talking about atoms and, you know, this, that, and sh the, the structure, right, you know, that it's made up of and the elements and whatever. So let's dive in, take a closer look, and, um, yeah, let's go with it. Again, uh, uh, links in the description. You can watch this without my commentary. Um, and, again, all the different videos from the Soul Foundation have been released. And the Soul Foundation co-founded Dr. Gary Nolan, Dave Grush, right, uh, Peter Scafish, uh, you know, other people, right, um, to study UFOs, right? So um, let's go. And this is Dr. Gary Nolan's presentation. There's another famous case, Ubatuba, 1950s. There's a primary witness, but we don't have it. Never, nobody ever had access to the primary witness, but a Brazilian journalist who received the evidence, uh, and again, through... Uh, the offices of, of Jacques, I was able to get access to some of this stuff. Uh, so he's talking about Jacques Vallée gave him these pieces, or at least gave him access, right, as he's stating, Jacques Vallée. And it, th this is actually what I don't quite understand is because, as you'll see from the result, it was claimed to be pure magnesium. I, what I was given was not magnesium. So, but we have two things called moisture A and moisture B, and that's Spanish for sample, I think, somebody said, um, told me. And then this is the instrument that we used, highly accurate mass spectrometer. Um, and just, you know, this is how, this is the beginning of sort of how science is done. You, you don't want to measure different things on different days because you want the experiment to be done under the most similar conditions that you can. So those samples, two examples of each of those samples, along with a, a zoo of other things that, that Jacques happened to have, um, were put on this. And then we did the analysis. And I remember sitting there when they, we, they printed out the data. And I was like, I don't understand this. I mean, I hoped that something like this would happen, but I never understood it. Um, I still don't. So one of the samples, claimed samples, has a, you know pretty much exactly the natural thing. We had two sh you know two shards of each. The other one was way off. Way off. I mean, just no doubt. Um, okay, so why? 1950s isotopes. If you mentioned isotopes to a 1950s crowd, they'd duck and cover, right? Because isotopes and still. Humans use, the, like, one of the most important things we do is we make nuclear bombs out of them. Um, of course, they're used uh, in other, for medical purposes and tracing. Um, but we don't have any chemical or material reasons to use them. So, okay, so what's, what's going on? So one had 
not? Why change the isotope ratios? Back then, it was extraordinarily expensive to do these kinds of separations. It's still expensive. I mean, my lab orders extremely small amounts of different isotopes uh, from the uh, periodic, from the, the lanthanide series, because we use them as tags in our biology experiments, because each of them is unique. Um, so for the uninitiated, what are isotopes? Again, this is, thank you, ChatGPT, and it made some things up, of course. But, you know, um, the, the idea here is, you know, humans work with elements. But somebody is playing with isotopes. So why would you play with isotopes? Because they're supposed to be the same. That's what I was taught in chemistry. Well, it turns out that's wrong. Now, people are starting to look at isotopes because you have an extra neutron in the element, and that changes the electronic configuration of the, of the orbitals just slightly. And so in the right circumstances, having that difference would be sufficient to make a better catalyst. And so people, pharmaceutical companies and others are starting to use this, starting to understand that, hey, there's something interesting here. Silicon, some of the uh, isotopes of silicon make better qubit holders that last longer than others, than the other three. Okay, so there it is. I mean, it's, it's there. Plants use it. Actually, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, so there's something yet to be understood. Okay, so <laughs> this was the first time that I had gone beyond just magnesium, uh, looking at the ubatuba material. And even though we, we looked at the magnesium, because that instrument that I just showed you can see down to the parts per million, um, we were looking at that level. When I looked at this, it was almost entirely pure silicon. Okay, well, what's the natural state of silicon? Uh, sand, silicon oxide, quartz, things like that. Um, it doesn't come prepackaged as 99.999395. Yeah, you just don't get it. So why is somebody tossing that level of purity around? Because uh, again, it would be, that would be expensive to make. Um, so why would, you, why would you do it? So again, we go in and we're collecting this data. And by the way, I'm showing all of this because all of this will be going eventually on the web and I wanna do this with every material that I can get my hands on legally. Legally. Um, real quick. Twenty-four fifty-two. Okay, hang on. Right here. Look, um, th this is this is what I wanted to read. Um, so I didn't read this. So the the incident. Okay, Ubatuba. Right. So the pieces he's talking about. The incident reportedly took place uh, in the nineteen fifties, with the most cited date being nineteen fifty-seven. Witness. The primary witness was a Brazilian journalist named Ibrahim Sued, who received physical evidence from an anonymous source. Physical evidence. The evidence consisted of metal fragments claimed to be from a disintegrated UFO. Description of incident. According to reports, a UFO was observed over the beach at Ubatuba. It suddenly exploded, scattering metallic debris. Analysis of fragments. Initial examination suggested the material was highly pure magnesium with some studies indicating an unusual level of purity, right? Potentially not typical of terrestrial manufacturing processes at the time. So, you know, that's, uh, that's interesting, right? And again, right here, in 1957, extraordinarily expensive to make. But again, he's getting it from an anonymous source. Look, this thing exploded. Because I hear people talking on Twitter like, Oh, um, it's, it's, uh, d you know, like donations or UFO poop. I'm not joking. That's what somebody said. Like it's UFO poop or something like these UFOs drop off stuff, shoot out pieces of metal or something like that seems so odd. Why would it shoot out pieces of metal? Like it's using metal. Is it using the energy of compressing this stuff together? And that's what it, it powers itself from. So then it dumps off what it made, you know, like it's, it's like creating diamonds in there and just pooping out diamonds. I don't know. 
Um, but all of the rest of it is fascinating, right? Like the rarity of it and the uniqueness of it. And, you know, Dr. Gary Nolan would even consider it something um, unusual, right? Yeah, all right. But the, the fact that this UFO just exploded, what? How would they explode? I mean, I think that's the first time I've ever heard of a UFO exploding. Just, right, exploding. And wouldn't there be more pieces or bigger pieces or, right? It's almost like, how could you get all the pieces? Especially over a beach, that means some of it went in water. Have people, you know, Dr. Avi Loeb should go down there and do what he did in uh, Papua New Guinea, right? Take that magnet and go pick up, maybe he can get some more, especially if you have already a sample. Right, so you may be able to create some sort of detection system based off the properties you have, and does that make sense? And then sort of reverse search that, right? Like a reverse image image search, uh, sort of scenario. I don't know, just throwing ideas here. I'm not smart, you know. I see all this stuff, guys, that comes up, and I, I don't know about y'all. I'm not afraid to admit that some of this goes over my head. You know, I'm not a scientist, but I can get the overall understanding of it, right? All right, let's go to this next clip, y'all. Again, this is, um, uh, again, Socorro, New Mexico. Do something like this. So here's another case, very famous case, Socorro. Again, this is something from, from Jacques. Uh, on an Indian reservation, the uh, police officer was, in, was an Indian, was Indian. Um, He's driving along, uh, he hears a noise, he sees something, a shiny object in a field. He observes little people outside of the object. The object takes off kind of with a burst of flame. Um, you know, and of course, when people tried to debunk it, he's, they said he, he saw the star something or other. You know, he's a, he's a trained observer, he's a policeman, right? So, um, he didn't want to talk about it, so he wasn't seeking publicity. He just did it. So, I, so Jacques had a piece. He gave it to me. Um, and Hang on. Let's go back and look at that slide. All right, let me read this out here. So again, Lottie Zamora, kind of a famous sighting, right? Um, police officer, Socorro, New Mexico. Um it's funny because uh, in Spanish, you know, socorro, socorro. It's like basically like SOS, at least in Spain, Castellano. Um, so it's funny that that's called, it's like SOS, New Mexico, right? <laughs> like help, New Mexico. Like that, that's what you say. Socorro, socorro. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't know. That, that, I don't know. Coincidence? I don't know. Just interesting. Uh, anyway. Date and location, April 24th, 1964, near Socorro, New Mexico. Initial sighting, Zamoro observed a flame and heard a roar, leading him to investigate the object, described as shiny, whitish, aluminum-like, and O-shaped, about 150 to 200 yards away. Figures observed, two individuals in white coveralls seen near the object. White coveralls, that's interesting. So that's sort of... Uh, you know, style of the time. People wearing coveralls out in fields and stuff, right? Like farmers. Objects activity. Emitting a blue and orange flame, the object ascended and rapidly moved away. It's interesting that it would have a flame, right? Um, just based off like, you don't use stuff like that. Or supposedly they don't use propellants like that or lift, as they call it, right? One of the observables. Interesting. I don't know. Maybe it's a glowing light instead. It's not actual flame, right? Physical evidence. Smoldering grass and brush found at the site and later an object. Zamora's later life eventually avoided public discussion of the incident and changed professions. I don't blame him. Um, that's interesting. So, Gary Nolan is going to get a piece of this, and um, from Jacques Vallée again, and yeah, he's going to share some of these results, y'all, and it's, it's interesting. So, Jacques had a piece, he gave it to me, he wasn't seeking publicity, he just did it, so, I, so Jacques had a piece, 
he gave it to me. Um, and, you know, again, we take an electron microscopy. Everything looks like it's, you know, from another planet uh, under, uh, under an electron microscope. Um, very simple. Aluminum, zinc, mostly, and some contaminants. But the aluminum and the zinc are in different places. So this is at a, a, a distance. So there it is. So there's the aluminum on the top. There's the zinc on the bottom, or vice versa. Now, zinc is zinc's the green, yes. But it's, it's differently distributed. It's the contaminants that are interesting. That's what I'm interested in. Because they're kind of a signature. They'll, is, are they uniformly distributed throughout the thing? Meaning, or, or are they somehow next to each other? So we looked at that. So now, if I look in the aluminum on the top, again, it's incredibly pure. It has like a single oxygen molecule amidst a million. I don't know who does that and why would you do it. It's attached to a zinc thing underneath, which has some aluminum in it. But look at how it's non-uniformly distributed. Right? There's like a cluster of it over here. Is that because they have a junky recipe? They didn't mix it right? It just is. But why? Don't know. Again, this case, I mean, this is clear. Clear sign of engineering. I mean, the interface between those things is, is like exact. Down to the atom. It's clearly the result of an industrial process. So this, of course, is not the only way to look at atoms or looking at materials at an ultra-high resolution. There's many other of these kinds of devices uh, that do different things, but none of them have the uh, exactitude that an, an APT has because uh, they provide at the five or so angstrom scale, and they're getting better. Um, and so I won't go into all of the others. But why, why do I show a table like that? Um, because we're actually starting a new initiative, uh, Starboss, Stardust Repository, taking a page from Avi. Everything is made of Stardust. Setting up standardized testing, so basically creating a federation of other scientists to whom we can go and pass the material along, because doing all the things you want to do would cost a bazillion dollars. So you have to have other people doing it more or less for free, um, or at least at, at cost. Uh, I mean, by the way, that thing that I, all those things I showed you, that was $40,000 to do that at a service center down in San Jose that does it and uses it for microelectronics. Deep vetting, make sure we're, no one's sending us junk. Uh, and again, it's, it's about, I can't look at everything and know the answers, but I want to get the data out there so everybody can. Maybe somebody will, will do it. Maybe my nephew here, who's interested in science, will do it. Um, I'll help him. <laughs> so, uh, organized under a public umbrella operation. Maybe that might induce somebody who has something claimed on the inside to bring it out and say, hey, why don't you help us with this, right? And actually, Avi did exactly this with the materials that they brought back from um, the South Pacific. You know, sending it around to other people, but now I, I, I want to standardize it and give other people, they don't ha other people don't need to participate in what we're doing, but I want to put out sets of protocols by which other people can do it, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, That's funded fair. by gifts or grants. Help, please. Um, and, uh, you know, the data freely available. But, I mean, we do want to also respect, and this is the biology community has gone through this at great depth, uh, where um, you get these big consortia, you collect the data, everybody's freaking out because they want to write the paper. Um, and so you've got to give them time to write the paper. Uh, but there's, all, there's at the end of it, uh, the deadline says, you know, we, we, public, we put it out there publicly um, after uh, one or two years. And that's fine because, frankly, collecting the data is the easy part. Understanding it's the hard part. You know, we spend months with bioinformatics and thinking about it, trying to figure it out. 
real quick, um, why don't they try to replicate some of these pieces and just see how easy it is to replicate? Right, that that seems like a good way to go because if it's something we can just replicate, even if it's expensive, I don't know. That wouldn't sound very non-human to me. Again, even if it's expensive, right? How could we have the technology to engineer the same thing? I don't know. Figure there'd just be this. I mean, think of the the think of the ship Bob Lazar described. Think of the TARDIS they're describing, right? Like, why would it have this kind of stuff? It just doesn't. It seems odd would be made of that but who knows right um the space station right now has materials in it that we use every day so all right i could see the you know the flip side of that again i'm not a scientist or anything i'm just thinking of stuff but it seems to me like trying to recreate that stuff might be a step in the right direction you might learn along the way how some of the things happened or talking to people who have recreated this stuff if that makes sense who have created stuff like this right it's like if you saw a cake and you're like trying to figure it out and like what's going on. Well, make a cake. And then you'll start to understand part of the process of it. And you'll understand that cake a lot more. So maybe if they tried to reverse engineer these pieces, if you will, um, let's see if they can create them again. I don't know. Um, but what do y'all think about this data part of it? Meaning, you know waiting till the data is like peer review they write a paper and then release it or are you guys just like just put it out you know there could be something to that right like i get trying to set up these protocols um standard you know operation standards like i get all that because it just doesn't exist right so like it kind of makes sense that some of this foundation would be set up first right to 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 look into this right because if we're like yeah just release all the stuff and then we'll study it well we there's no protocols right like we need to um maybe have some sort of standards in place before i i it, i mean if i'm being honest as i'm thinking about that that kind of makes sense just from a business standpoint if you've ever taken on a project in any way anything organized any, if you've you know have you planned an event have you planned a party i'm sure most of you have done something like that Right. There's stuff you just, just there's it makes sense to have some sort of steps right um, like this and protocols in place, especially if you run a business or have been a leader in some way. So I can understand this and appreciate some of this like but I also understand some of the frustrations. You know, I can read the comments and I can relate to so much like just release the stuff. This is just more of more stuff's coming, you know. Well, look, there's some results right here of stuff you could be digging into right here of these materials. Right. That's those are results, whether or not you like them or whatever. I mean, that's that's up to you to decide. But there is something here. Right. So I understand. Right. We need some protocols in place and, and to have some of these institutions in place to be able to study this. I mean, it just makes sense uh, in a lot of ways. But again, at the same time, I could totally understand people's you know frustrations about it. But. I mean, there definitely needs to be some sort of funding um, from our government, right, set up to study this stuff. Uh, you know, I don't think it needs to go through private organizations. And maybe maybe look at it the Elon Musk way, which is, you know, when Elon Musk wanted to build rockets, right, what, what did he first realize that was actually quite genius? He realized, man, this is expensive, Right. I'm, I'm why try to perfect this expensive type of rocket? I'm going to create a new rocket. It's going to be a lot harder at first. But by bringing the cost down per rocket, we can actually accomplish more in the long haul. So let's take two steps back, you know, to, to move quite a few steps forward. Right. So maybe there's something to that, meaning we can find ways to lower the cost of this testing. So that it's easier to do, you know, um, especially when you start outsourcing um, this stuff, right? Totally becomes expensive, right? You're like, well, let's start doing it in-house. It'll be cheaper, right? If we own the machine and every test we do, it, it right, it pays for itself uh, over time. But maybe, you know, there just needs to be like the UFO Research Center of America, 
I mean, I don't know. I just came up with that name. I'm just saying. Um, and you know, it's got equipment and sh and we're, we're studying materials that people are sending around. I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Let, let's, uh, let, um, Dr. Nolan take us out on the rest here. So, you know, I, I'm imagining now 30 years from now, and this is my warehouse, <laughs> uh, where I've collected all of these materials and actually we've used some of them to help analyze those materials. Right? Is there a discovery to be made? So uh, this, I think, is an important endeavor. I can't do it all. I'm not a metallurgist. But I think there's lots of, I get now increasing numbers of emails from people saying, how can I help? I'm getting the sign. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. So one thing real quick, um, you know, Let's let's talk about like the remember um, Gary Nolan talking about Neil deGrasse Tyson um, not too long ago, like his Ph.D. should be removed. And Neil deGrasse Tyson has gotten a lot of flack for not really taking the UFO subject seriously. Right. And a lot of scientists. Right. Let's put let's be real. And the idea is like, you know, they just don't they're not open minded. They're not. They're, that's the argument. Right. But think about this. Right. There's the world we live in. And then there's the world we want to live in. So we can bitch and complain on one hand, right, about the world we want to live in and why aren't these scientists taking it seriously. Or we can roll up our sleeves and go, let's give them a reason to take it seriously. So by Dr. Gary Nolan and other scientists doing all of this stuff, right, what they're doing is creating sort of a seriousness around it right, that some of these scientists can start to take it seriously, right, because it's like, oh, I'm doing this thing over here with the Soul Foundation, right, it's well respected, oh, okay, you know, it, it, it can start to lead credence, and some of these scientists can start to come out and, and want to get involved because they see a serious investigation going, and again, we can bitch and just say, well, just do it, just, just be open-minded, man, like, it's not going to work, and making fun of them and putting them down or whatever, that's definitely not going to work, that's not going to make them want to come be a part of the community, if that makes sense. So I think creating some, you know, I totally understand I'm trying to create a serious side to this um, so that it can open the door for people to come in and study it. Because, you know, like it or not, we are going to need the science community to get behind it. I mean, we just are in the long run. So, I mean, I could see that. So, you know, just was coming to me as I'm, listening to Gary I was thinking about that, you know, just right now, just thought about it. Like, yeah, I get that. Right. It's, 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 again, we have to accept the world we live in, not the one we want to live in and the world, you know, we live in, that's how science is treating it. So, you know, complaining about a bitchy is not going to change it and insulting them is not going, definitely not going to change. And we want change. So you just ignore it and okay, here's, we'll give you a reason. Here's some foundations. Here's some places like th this is real research going on, you know, because and uh, Gary Nolan did an interview on the Matt Ford show, the Good Trouble show. Sorry, with Matt Ford. Um, and he talked about just yesterday and he talked about how people came to the conference who are other Stanford professors who he he knew but didn't know, just knew of them. And they showed up like 10 of them, like a lot, like to see what was going on. Why? Because it was a serious discussion about it. And they'd always been interested, but afraid to get involved because of the ridicule, right? So it's like that stigma is still there. And in science, that stigma is definitely still there. You know, maybe in day-to-day -day life, you, you know, people are happy to talk about UFOs. It's a fun topic. People like to get in and it's a spectrum of seriousness that people take it, right? But people are definitely down to have the conversation for the most part. And science, they're more willing to have the conversation is life out there, but not has life visited here. That to them is silly. You know, because in their minds, it would be so obvious that they 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 would know about it, right? Um, so I think that's all it is. You know, the science community, like a lot of communities, it's it, it that that stigma spread like a virus, right, throughout the community, but it can also be vaccinated in the sense that 
it can spread, or, you know, another virus, a good virus, right? That stigma can be lifted just as quickly as it was put on, in my opinion, by creating these serious studies and a serious approach to looking at this. That's just the truth. So, you know, I don't know. Curious to hear y'all's opinions um, about that. And what does that look like? I don't know. Is disclosure messy? Yeah. Is it going to please everybody? No. Do we want the answers now? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I do too. I do too, man. I can I can totally relate to the comments I'm seeing of like, F this already, man. Just give us the shit. Like, I get it, dude. I do. I just, you know, I can't help myself. I, I put on different hats and I, 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 I just see things from a lot of angles all the time. I, I just can't help it. And about everything, man, in my life. Trust me, I'm, I'm like this about everything. And I can just see the other side of, you know, okay, we got to do it this way. And it's just not going to give everything everybody wants. So I don't know. Is this a step forward in the right direction? I think so. If I'm being honest, I do. What's going to come of it? I don't know. But at least somebody's doing something, you know? I mean, just giving interviews on podcast, like, and that's the end of it. I mean, okay, he started a foundation. He's putting results out. He's getting people together for a conference. Yes, I get they're just giving presentations, but this is how it starts. They got to do this first to get people energized and want to join and to be a part and help out. I mean, I get it. I mean, look, our government isn't even recognizing it. How, I mean, right? We, we, there's just so many steps to take. There's so many things that need to, like so many doors that need to be unlocked before we can get out there and start doing things. So like, I get it. But it is frustrating, right, for the average person, just like me and you. Like, I get it. I get it, man. I, I just want to see that UFO already, y'all, right? Like, let's go. I, I want to have my mind just absolutely blown away because, I'm, I, again, I'll be honest, seeing those, like, cra you know, materials and the, the analysis of, you know, isotopes and stuff, I mean, I'm, it just doesn't excite me. I, I'm not saying it shouldn't. And maybe that's part of the problem, right? I don't know. But I am, again, if I just calm down and say, okay, th this is a step in the right direction. This is kind of what it could look like. And there's many facets to what it could look like, you know? So anyway, hope y'all are enjoying the videos. I think I'm going to do one more tomorrow about Jacques Vallée. Uh, his video uh, found very, very interesting. And I'm probably do a couple clips from a few of them kind of round it out that way. I don't know, maybe one or two more. I'm not, I'm not sure, honestly. Y'all give me the feedback. And if there's a particular video in there of the Soul Foundation videos you want me to cover, tell me. I'll, I'll pick that one out. I've pretty, gosh, I got a lot. I got through half of them today. So I got to get through the other half uh, in the next couple days. So, but I am helping a friend move tomorrow. Uh, shout out to my friend Dave. So I don't know if I can get to it tomorrow. So anyway, we'll see. Um. Uh, but not missing a video, y'all. I do not miss videos. That That's still videos coming out every day. So, but anyway, me catching up on the other videos. Whatever. I'm out, y'all. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Next video, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Remember, y'all, every day's a gift. Enjoy the week, y'all. Peace.